Hello, and welcome to Whiskey and Wool. My name is Shannon, and I am coming to you from northern New Jersey, where I work and live and craft. And this is a channel about knitting and spinning and um, fiber, 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 fiber. <laughs> the kind you wear and make into cloth, not the kind you eat. Um, yeah, so welcome returning viewers and new viewers alike. If this is your first time here, I hope you enjoy. Um, and if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. And I hope you also enjoy. I hope everyone gets a chance to get a little beverage of their choice and sit back and listen to my updates. I have a, quite a few finished objects to share with you today. And I have some exciting whips too. But before we get into the wool, I am going to take you on a whiskey chat. Um, I am going to be filming it later tonight, uh, but if you have been following along and you watched my last episode, episode 79, this is episode 80, wow. Um, if you watched episode 79, I talked about wanting to try a whiskey from Glen Guile, which is a distillery in Campbelltown that's owned by the same family that owns Springbank. I found some, so I'm going to be tasting that. I'm going to let my future self tell you all about it. So have fun. I'll tell you where to skip to if you're not interested. Hey there, I'm here for your whiskey chat. Um, it is a little bit later in the day. It's actually just ahead of dinner. Um, so I'm going to have a little uh, pre-dinner cocktail. I have my new summer. Oh, you haven't seen it yet. My, I'm going to show you later. I got a new candle, summer solstice candle, so I have that lit. And I am going to sit back and taste this delicious new to me whiskey. Um, this is actually quite interesting. So here I have a, I've poured my wee dram, my little tasting dram, um, with a little bit, and I've put a couple drops of water in there, which you can maybe see. I've swirled it around as well. Mmm, I haven't even told you what it is, but wow. Ooh, it tastes like, I mean, it smells like Christmas cake. <laughs> uh, all right, what am I tasting? So I am tasting this Kilcurran 12 year. So this is super exciting. If you watched my last episode, I talked about the distillery uh, Springbank, owned by the Mitchell family, and it's been in the Mitchell family for almost since the beginning of its time. Um, definitely since it was legal. And the Mitchell family was involved with it when it was illegal, like pre-1822, which was 1822, I think, was the first year that UK allowed distilleries to incorporate or like to be established to not sell illicit product instead to sell legal product. Um, so yeah, the Mitchell family still owns Springbank Distillery in Campbelltown in the Campbelltown region. I will put a map on here so you can see where Campbelltown is. What I found out in researching Springbank was that the Mitchell family also established a distillery called Glen Guile in Campbelltown in uh, the 1880s, I believe it was established. I'll tell you more when I get to the website for Glengyle Distillery. The And Glengyle ended up getting sold off and it went silent, as they say, for a while, which I'm going to tell you the history of that. Um, but it ended up back in the Mitchell family, the family that owns Spring Bank and has owned Spring Bank for several hundred years, illicitly. <laughs> They don't want to admit to it. They established it, though, in 1828, so at least for almost 200 years. Um, they now own the uh, Glengyle Distillery again, and they repurchased it in the early 2000s. And, yeah, so I am sampling a 12 years. Let me just jump over to their website so I can tell you about them. They are what they affectionately call themselves uh, the newest oldest <laughs> the newest oldest distillery is that what they call themselves hang on let me just make sure i'm getting the phrase right newest old distillery 
not newest, oldest, newest old distillery in Campbelltown. And they have actually have made a video that you can see on YouTube or I'm not going to, I'll link it, I guess. I don't know. I'll put it in my show notes. Um, but I'm not going to, um, play it because it's long. It's like 15 minutes. So I don't want to spend time doing that. I just want to tell you, I'm going to just wind through their history a tiny bit. Uh, so yeah, they have a long and colorful history. They were, uh, which begins with William Mitchell, which I had talked about in last week's, um, or last, my last episode in episode 79, I talked about him purchasing Glengyle or establishing Glengyle, uh, distillery in Campbelltown. Uh, his father, Archibald Mitchell was the founder of Springbank. And yeah, so they were also, the family was not just distillers, but there was also um, farmers. So Glen Guy and Springbank both do do the barley to barrel, or to bottle, really, body, b- barley to, far, like farmland to the bottle, complete whiskey production uh, right there in Campbelltown region of Scotland. So it's pretty cool. Um, and I talked about last in my last episode about how Campbelltown is, um, also one of the (laughs) oldest. It had like a, I talked all about the history of Campbelltown, which I'm not going to redo here. You can go back and watch the whiskey chat in uh, episode 79 if you want to know more. Um, but I'm just going to focus here on Glen Gyle to keep this kind of short because I think my wool episode, episode chat is much longer than I intended. I mean, going to do some serious editing, I hope, but it, this episode overall will be kind of long. So I don't want to, um, expand here. So anyway, Glen Gyle was, uh, Founded in, oh, in 1872. And they called it Mitchell's Glengyle Distillery. And William Mitchell was the sole proprietor. Uh, And they suffered in the economic downturn at the beginning of the 20th century and eventually were bought out in 1919. So they didn't, they weren't, they, you know, went along for a good 50 years there and then got sold uh, to West Highland Malt Distillery and then were sold again five years later in 1924 for 300 pounds, 300 pounds, um, (laughs) before they finally went silent in, uh, 1925. Uh, the entire spirit stock, oh, this answers one of my questions that I've had for quite a while about what happens when a distillery goes silent. What happens to the barrels? Because you know, they weren't planning to go silent. The entire stock was auctioned off on April 8th in 1925. Um, so they didn't produce any more, spirit, but the buildings remained in constant use right up until modern days. Uh, it was, they were used for different things in the twenties, 1920s. They were rented out to a rifle club, um, (laughs) for a number of years. And then later were used for, as a sales office for agricultural company. Um, and actually because it had continued to be used for other purposes, repurposed buildings had been repurposed, it became one of the best preserved former distilleries in Campbelltown. Um, there were several attempts to reopen the Glengyle distillery in the past. The first was about 16 years after it had been closed down. It had been bought by, uh, this family called Blotch Brothers, B-L-O-C-H Brothers, uh, who were the owners of Glen Scotia distillery, which, um, that's some of my lost footage. I talked about Glen Scotia. I tasted Glen Scotia. Uh, and then lost the footage. Um, yeah, so I will re- I'll taste Glen Scotia again in the future when I get another uh, opportunity to do that. But uh, so it was 16 years later, so that was around 1940, and the World War II then happened and uh, prevented them from really being successful. So again, it, then later in the 1950s, uh, Campbell Hem- Henderson applied to reopen it now investing 250,000 pounds, so a huge difference, to modernize Glengyle and reopen it, but then he ended up not being able to be successful. Um, But then third time was the charm in November of 2000, 75 years after Glengyle had last produced Spirit. um, The Mitchell family uh, went, went ahead and bought the buildings and began to, um, 
they renovated it. There's a whole story, uh, as I said, on YouTube about their renovation. So I have a picture here of what the buildings look like when they took ownership. Um, they retrofitted back to uh, it being a distillery again and uh, began to produce in 2002. 2002, because their first 12 year was released in 2016, so that would have meant 12, 2004. 2004, no, yeah. as I said, um, is the correct answer. So 2004 was when they first began to put whiskey in barrels, but it took so it took four years for them to retrofit. I think in 2002 they started to um, the process of uh, distilling and such. Does it say here? No, I don't really have, um, probably somewhere else on the website, so if I find it, we'll talk about it. Instead, I want to jump to why they name it Kilcurran and not Kilcurran, I think is the proper pronunciation, Kilcurran. Um, they chose Kilcurran because the Glengyle name had already been, was being used by it for a blended Highland malt, and, um, Mitchell, the Mitchell family was not able to purchase rights to that name, so and they wanted to avoid confusion between a blended and a single malt um, from the Campbelltown region, so they just went with Kilcurran, and it is derived from the Gaelic... Uh, oh my goodness, I am not going to try to pronounce this. I'll put this on screen. Which was the name of the original settlement where St. Curran had his religious cell and it is the area upon which Campbelltown now stands. And so it was thought to be a suitable name for a Campbelltown malt. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, wait, I'm going to go to the making of... So they... So the first 12-year, which I'm drinking the 12-year, was... They have a bunch of different whiskeys, and they're very... Most of them are young because they're a young distillery. Um, I can tell you that though... The distilling and um, to, through the point where the whiskey is put into barrels, that that is all done on site at Glengyle. But then the ma maturation process, when the barrels are stacked on shelves and left for years to mature, that's all done at Springbank. So the maturing is done at Springbank. I don't think they do any, I don't think they have space to do maturing on, on the Glen, on the premises of Glengyle. Um, I actually don't even know if they have a tasting room. I assume they do because they do have tours. So they, there must be some sort of tasting room that goes with the tours. Um, but anyway, most of their whiskeys are young. They have an eight year. They have the 12 year. They have a heavily peated uh, that does not have a year. Now remember that scotch in order to be called considered scotch must be uh, held in barrels for three years on Scottish soil somewhere. Um, so yeah, and they have a seven year sherry matured. They have a seven year bourbon matured, a six year sherry matured. Their bottles are, the designs of the labels are beautiful. They're very colorful. <laughs> They're right up my alley, like pink and greens and golds. They're very springy colors. Um, they have a bourbon matured six year in process and in process five year. Um, which is supposed to be chocolatey and orangey. That really sounds good. And a five-year in-process bourbon. Um, I wanted to see if there was... I thought I saw something about the... Um, so there's not much... I don't know barrel... Other than those barrel-specific, like sherry barrel, bourbon barrel specifics, I don't know what they do with the 12 year they don't say uh the process they just say that it's generally a mixture of the sherry barrels and bourbon barrels that you see used in most other distillery and just dist and maturation processes um oh my gosh i can smell it it's like there's i'm sitting by a window and i could oh, smell it coming over it smells so good uh yeah so um do they say anything else their whiskey yeah, wait, wait, wait. There was the thing about the where I was talking about the years, and I was getting confused. Um, yeah, so they the first casks were laid down in two thousand four. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. So that meant that the first twelve year was released in twenty sixteen. So it's twenty twenty. Um, 
Yeah, so I ended up finding this from, I'm going to jump over to the tasting now. Um, I ended up finding this from my favorite site for flavors, the Flaviar. They have, they sell tasting sets. So I bought a little tasting set since I was, uh, first of all, because I could find it for Glengyle. Um, and they, the, uh, the bottles, the tasting that they send you is quite big. This is about, uh, two drams worth. I think it's technically a dram and a half, but I could easily get two tastings out of this. I might just finish this later after dinner. Um, after I'm done tasting this. And they also send you these really cool little tasting things, which I haven't looked at because I'm trying to do this cold because I want to tell you what I taste before I read to you what it's supposed to taste like because I'm not as good as they are, but I like to try. So what do I smell? Oh, I would say like plum and red apple and mm, yeah, it's been sitting for a little bit. So the flavors like as after you put the water in and you let it kind of sit, the flavors kind of bloom in it. So, yeah, I was first smelling a lot of alcohol, and now I don't. I smell a little cakey smell, too, like vanilla or maybe butterscotch. Ooh, wow. Wow, this has a punch. Oh, it's good. Oh, wow. In the back, at the end, you get this chocolatey cake, like chocolate cake taste. It's really good. Oh my gosh. Well, oh, there's such a strong flavor up front and I'm not placing it. It all, it tastes sort of spicy, like a wooden, like a, like sandalwood almost, if that makes sense. Like kind of a woody spice. Hmm. That finish though, wow, this is really delicious. And it's a, a fairly soft golden color. I think maybe you can see it in them. It's not an old gold like what, like the spring bank that I tried last week, the tenure. It's a pretty soft buttery color. Ooh, yeah, wow. Okay, it's got kind of like, um. there's salt. Like I taste a salty, almost like ocean air at the end. Oh, I have to have one more taste. Ooh, wow. I really love it. Okay. Let's see what it says. Okay, so citrus, that's up front. So citrus zest, biscuit, ginger. Oh, sorry. Am I going in the right direction? Yes, yeah, citrus zest, almond, butterscotch, toasted oat, marshmallow, apricot, and smoke at the end. So they don't say that there's any chocolate. The butterscotch, marshmallow, toasted oak is at the end. Okay, I could believe that. Some apricot and smoke. So see, they... Usually when I'm reading flavors to you, I can't show you easily, but this is the this little like flavor spiral that they do, that Flaviar does. Um, you can find it from most of the whiskeys. Um, it's interesting, the Glen Scotia that I tasted, which is another Campbelltown uh, whiskey, I couldn't find um, from Flaviar. Couldn't find their taste. I'm gonna read to you too. What the distillery says I should be tasting. So we'll do a we'll do a comparison here. The distillery says nose oak notes are dominant, followed by toasted marshmallows. Okay, so that was that cakey marzipan, dried fruit pudding, and cherries. Okay, so the red when I was saying plum, it was actually cherries. And they think you should smell a hint of peat. I, it smells sweet to me. So I guess it's that toasted marshmallow sweetness with the cherries and marzipan. And then on the palate, citrus, orange peel, followed by vanilla, butterscotch, honeycomb, and biscuits can all be tasted and enjoyed. The finish, velvet smooth with lemon meringue. Ooh, concluded with saltiness and oiliness that you'd expect. Mmm. Wow. 
It's really yummy. I mean, I probably say that about all of them, but yeah, I really like this one. It was a very interesting find. I'm so happy that I did Spring Bank last time, so that which led me to Kilcurran. So yeah, I would highly recommend this. I hope you get a chance to enjoy a dram of your choice, whether it is one that I have tried and talked about for you, with you, or if it's one that you like. If you have any suggestions, if you, because I'm getting to the end of my advent calendar, I only have two left and then I have two of these. If you have suggestions for ones that you want me to try and talk about, I'm happy to um, put those in my queue and pick that up and yeah, give it a shot with you all. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you get a chance to try your own and I will see you soon. Bye. All right, you're back. Hopefully you're, you've got, you know, a beverage of your choice. This is some tea from uh, earlier today that is cold, but was hot once. <laughs> it just took too long to, uh, to drink it. That's fine. I don't mind it when it's room temperature. Anyway, I have a finished object. I am wearing a finished object. Uh, yay. Yay! So I finished another rye layering tee. Uh, and this one is, I'll put a picture in here of me wearing it. It's got some really wild pooling, which I think you can see a little bit uh, on it. Um, I notice like, I look crooked. There we go. Now I look, look okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, another rye layering tee. You know, I hesitated to post this on Instagram only because I inadvertently did a detail very similar to Hohi's latest design. Um, so the Rye Laring Tee is a pattern of my own design. It was designed to be a rib knit and I was curious about what it would look like as a stockinette stitch, but I didn't want to do entirely stockinette so I chose to do a little rib knit panel down the front and um, Hohi has designed a tank <laughs> top similar to this with hers has a deeper scoop and it also is made out of linen so her pattern is written for a linen yarn which is really cool one of these days one of these these summery knitting seasons I will knit a linen tee I have had it in you know in on my mind for the last few years I just never seem to get it on the needles fast enough I need to buy the linen yarn and then just have it here so I can Go ahead and cast it on. I don't have any linen yarn. I've knit with linen before, but it's been quite a while. Um, anyway, her tee has the exact same rib knit. Not Mine's two by two. I think hers might be one by one, but a rib knit detail right down the front. So I was like, oh man, like I did not intend to copy her. It just is one of those things that organically happened. Like I went ahead and made this variation on my rye layering tee pattern. Um, but... Yeah, anyway, I like it. it. It did what I wanted. So the rib, I wanted the rib to just create a little shape because it does have, um, in this, this pattern was written for ribs. So in stockinette stitch, you do get a li little bit more bagginess um, in the silhouette, which is fine. Uh, works, it, you know, both work well, like the rib sort of hugging your curves or the stockinette just kind of hanging out and giving you this extra... Uh, ease and bagginess is all good. Um, it's very, very comfortable. It's, a, it's it's not a boiling hot day here. It's probably in the 80s, uh, mid 80s, I'd say. It's overcast, so it doesn't feel quite so warm, um, but it's not swampy, uh, humid like it has been. Uh, in this, this summer, we've had a lot of swampy, swampy heat days. So yeah, I'm perfectly comfortable in it. It's It's perfect. This type of uh, neckline is really great for zoom calls where people are just seeing you from here up um, and I can move around and not worry about showing cleavage when it's inappropriate so I do really really like it and I am now done with my spring summer knitting and I'm moving into fall knitting um, and I have so many gift knits planned or th that I'm thinking about I'll get into those later um, but let, let me finish with, before I even show you, talk to you about what Martha's wearing, I have another finished object. Actually, it's two finished objects. And one of, and these two finished objects go with a whip. 
But uh, before I tell you, I need to tell my daughter-in-law, Priscilla, to not watch if she wants to be surprised with this gift. <laughs> I'm planning on gifting it to her soon, like within a week. Um, but if she wants to be surprised, she should not watch. And I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm going to instead put information on screen so that she can just put her phone down or her device down and walk away. And Priscilla, I'll tell you when to come back. <laughs> so you've been warned. Anyway, I finished this adorable little knit for my granddaughter my, who is coming in October. Um, I love it. I think it's going to hopefully fit her pretty shortly after birth. Um, and I made this to go with it. I have no idea if this is going to be something that will fit her. We'll see. We'll see. So those are ready um, to be to be gifted. So you, I will have put the pattern. This was a freeform pattern, this one. So I didn't, I don't have a specific pattern. I just um, copied the same stitch uh, from the one thing to the other. <laughs> so I think it's just freeform. But if you're interested, I have all my notes on Ravelry if you want um, to. Don't, don't come back, Priscilla. I have one more thing to show. And I've also done this. I'm making this. This is just a really simple, basic, <laughs> it's on screen, um, you, where you can, you can, you know, I hope, I hope that this will be more size inclusive, uh, cause it's got a lot of ease and hopefully it'll fit her. It'll fit the baby for quite a while. Um, yeah. So those are, those are some, those are the baby knits. I have a little bit more information about baby knits and my future knits, which Priscilla, you can come back now um, and look on screen. Yeah, so I have some other future baby knits that I don't mind Priscilla seeing, and I don't think she would mind seeing either because they're just like, these things are things that I'm thinking about. Um, so I am going to talk about that later when I get towards the end of the episode. And uh, yeah, so those are my finished objects, and I have several whips to share with you, and then I'm going to talk to you about spinning. So let's talk about what Martha's wearing. <laughs> this is the Kima sweater and by Ching Fiber, and I it is a fairly new pattern. I was obsessed with it before I even knew the name of it. It is such a beautiful and interesting knit. Uh, it has been a little hit and miss in terms of like I've, I had I have a little trepidation about it it's almost done now though and I think I feel good about it it is not completely on Martha I'm gonna just spin her around you can see that she she's just got it pinned on her front because uh, I have a fairly small needle um, circumference here and it won't fit over her shoulders so that I could actually have it on but I am three rows away from casting off this sweater. And I really, really thought uh, I would have it done for today's episode. But, uh, well, so let me back up in case you're new here. This sweater, in my last episode, I was plowing through it. I got the yarn. Um, the pattern was released. I had ordered the yarn. The yarn arrived, like, within a few days of the pattern being released. And I was so excited I start and I knit away on it and I got to about oy, about eight rows back about to here and I ran out of yarn so I ran out of this this uh, yellow fluff poofy yarn so I had to panic order a third skein which I did and it took a while to come because Ching is in UK I'm here in uh, the US and it probably took it actually came faster because I think the la my last episode which was two weeks ago I had ordered it maybe a day or two so it came it came within two weeks which is awesome like that was that's pretty speedy <laughs> for UK to US I thought it would be like four weeks and so the anyway the yarn the third skein of the floof which I'll tell you all about the yarn in a sec my third skein of floof came on Thursday and I thought, great, I only have like 10 rows to knit. I, sh I should have it done for my episode this weekend, but nope. 
It is. I've got about four, four rows done. I have three rows to go. I think I got about four rows done Thursday night and four rows done last night, Friday night. And that was as far as I got. I just knew like it was getting later and later last night and I thought to myself, I'm going to get to the bind off and it is going to be gnarly because what you do for the bind off is you create, you, um, you bend the yarn, you bend the hem up. So you take the last three rows and those become like, they bend inside and you create like a casing like, like that of, um, where you put a drawstring which is great, right? I have the drawstring made. You make the drawstring out of your main, out of your um, DK. So there's my drawstring. I followed her directions and made that. So the drawstring gets encased in as you bind off. And I just was like, oh my God, this thin lace weight yarn with these big fat needles, it's a uh, US size 13 or a nine millimeter. I think it's nine millimeter. Yes, nine millimeter needle. Really slow knitting. It's slow knitting. Like you, when you knit a row, you're knitting about a half inch because the stitch, you can see that the stitches are quite big. But it just takes a long time to make it all the way around because it's a lot of stitches. I want, I'm not sure what the stitch count is exactly, but I want to say it's pretty close to three, maybe even three and change, 300 and change. Um, so it's a lot of stitches to get around is why it took me so long it took me like I was basically getting a row done every half hour or so or maybe every 20 minutes at the fastest which that's slow <laughs> so what is the yarn um the yellow floof is uh, a biching fiber and it is her veronita base in the colorway butterscotch it is a 79% cashmere, 21% silk. So it is a cashmere lace yarn. Um, each skein is 25 grams and 300 meters. And uh, yeah, lace weight. Recommended on a, for a four millimeter needle, which would still be a pretty large needle for a lace weight. Well, it's just 2.5 to four millimeters. So 2.5 would give you a pretty tight um, knit. The main color, which is this one right here, is some of my own hand spun yarn. This is a four ply, which I talked all about in the process of making it a few episodes back. Um, if I can remember, I'll put on screen which episode I really talked about it. I, I, it, this, this went on, this was a project that probably overlapped a couple episodes. Um, yeah, I was bummed I ran out of yarn. So the trials and tribulations of this sweater, <laughs> I, was taken aback when I got, you know, probably to about here on the sweater. And I realized that, well, so I've knitted, I said tw uh, eight, I've knit eight rows, about eight rows. When I ran out of yarn, I still had four more rows to go by the pattern. And it was going to be right around my waist. So, yeah, the waist on Martha's right here. You see the tape? That's her waistline. And where this red um, stitch marker is, that's about where I ran out of yarn. <laughs> uh, so it was going to be quite cropped, just too, more, more cropped than I liked, more cropped than I thought would be flattering on my body type. Um, besides that, I have a pretty large chest, so it was just, I thought my chest would probably just make it, you know, rise up. So I really wanted to go for more length, and so in a way it was sort of a blessing in disguise that I ran out of yarn, because running out of yarn meant I could now, I would now have a brand new skein and I could knit for quite a while. Um, I think it's good now, like I was seeing how it was last night, so now it's going to hit my, about my high hip in the front, so you can see that the back is lower, and I think you can see through the yellow, there's a little, see that pink shadow, that is the back, so the back has a dip in the, it like a, it creates a shirt tail hem style, which I think is going to look so good. I'm really excited about this, I hope I like it. <laughs> I've just been so obsessed about this pattern for such a long time. Um, 
that I really, really, really hope I love it. I hope I love it. Um, I have ordered yarn, more yarn. I ordered a kit from Ching Fiber when she released her Kima sweater kits, which was about a month ago. Um, and it's black. I'm so excited about it. Um, so I hope I like it enough. If I don't like this style enough, I think I can do some mods. Like I was figuring out that it may be more flattering on me if this, if this solid part comes down lower. So maybe I just do that shirt tail shaping on both the front and back. I think that might, that I might like it better. Or maybe I do a modified shirt tail, um, you know, sort of shaping across the front here. I think, I think I would like it better. And then I also won't be so concerned about knitting the length as much. So yeah. Get this look, oh my gosh, so, you know, I thought I lost a stitch because it is really a pain if you lose a stitch with this. But yeah, I really, really love the color combination. I think it looks amazing. I think these are good colors for me. These are colors that I like to wear. Um, and, uh, oh, after I'm done with, I mean, these sleeves. Look at these sleeves. They're so fancy and beautiful with these gathers and this beautiful drape. There, I will be knitting a cuff uh, after I'm done with the bottom. I could have knitted the cuff while I was waiting for the yellow, the second third skein rather of the yellow yarn to come but I worried that if I didn't like the way this section right here looked on my body that I would want to rip it back but I think I'm actually going to be okay with it like now that I've knit more and I've been looking at it for a while and I and I sort of like spread out because it's you know it's bound up on this needle on this cord the short cord um I think you know, spread out and on the body, it's, this is going to look fine. It's not going to look too poopy gathered. Plus this is very drapey. So it's not going to stand out like this either. Cause this is because of the cord. So it'll like kind of drape and fall. I think it's going to fall. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, what else can I tell you? There's a lot of very interesting techniques. The structure of this sweater was not anything I have ever done before. Um, because you you knit the top down part to here the same old way that you do any top down sweater where you start at the neck you cast on right in the front though which was I thought was interesting because most sweaters have you cast on in the back but the, the cast on is right here uh, and you there was some some mods that I from the pattern that I wrote in my um, project notes on Ravelry. One was the neckline. She has you. She says do two rows, two rounds of moss stitch, but moss stitch is a four round repeat. So I just did seed stitch, which looked like the picture. So I think that's what they meant. Then, um, as I said, you knit. It's raglan sleeves. You knit down to here, and then after that, you knit this sleeve panel alone so you, you go from here you put all the stitches on hold and then you just go down and then you do the other side and then you do the back you you do that shirt tail him back and then you you stitch the body across uh wrist to wrist for a while and like you create this sort of dolman shaping and then you do all sorts of really interesting um stitches like easy stitches like uh, knit two together SSKs like different ways to get these like got this like gathered look along the sleeves it was really cool it was interesting like I had never made a sweater using some of these techniques um, and I love love the combo of this DK weight with the lace I just love it. I think it looks so terrific. And I also, the um, DK weight, you knit it in a much smaller needle. So I think I used, oh right, it's that weird, it's a seven millimeter. It's a weird size, yeah, seven millimeter, which in US, there isn't really a US size 10 and three quarters, but that's what it would end up being because seven millimeters right between a 10 and a half and 11. So, um, yeah, so I had to buy a seven millimeter needle because I didn't have one, which is 
massive for a DK weight, but the fabric looks amazing. Like it looks really good. Like a DK weight, normally you'd knit on maybe a four millimeter or even a 3.75 um, to get a nice weave. But I really love the way the fabric looks in um, seven millimeters. So yeah, I like it. It's a, it's a good, it's a good combo. So, all right, on to other whips. Um, this thing, I'm ready. I am ready to put this to bed. I'm going to just talk about this briefly, but I'm hoping that by the next time I see you, this will be done. This is my pink velvet uh, sweater. It is a uh, pattern by Andrea Mowry, and... Uh, yeah, I, I've knit quite a lot on it. I don't know if you can really even tell because once I finish the yoke, um, it's just been, you know, plain knitting. Um, and I think I've knit like poof, about three inches on it. I have about six inches or so to go on the body. And yeah, I'm ready for this to be off the needles. I, I had started this ahead of summer, and then what I did was I sort of, because I was just curious to see how the pattern would knit, um, the pattern is designed, actually out of Ching Fiber also, the pattern is designed for Ching Fiber Melted Baby Surrey yarn, which you can see here. It's got a high fuzz. It's alpaca, silk, and merino, and it's also a DK weight. It knits like a DK weight. It's probably officially like a sport weight, but it knits like a DK weight. Um, so I was curious to see how it would knit. So I kind of, you know, did the whole yoke and then put it aside for a while and then just kind of knit on it here and there um, while I did this tank top and another tank top just because I wanted to get the tank tops done so I could wear them this year. Whereas this is really not something I'm going to put on until October or November. So I thought, hmm, I can put that aside and just sort of, you know, you know, take a laid back approach to finishing it. But you know what? I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm ready for this to be gone. I want this done and off the needle. So I know once I get to the bottom and I get onto the sleeves, the sleeves are, I can do in a few days, um, just a couple evenings watching shows, I can get like, almost one done in one night and I can finish the other one like in about three nights of sitting and knitting uh, I should be able to get them done so yeah I'm ready for this to be done so I hope this is done this is going to the front of the queue for the next few weeks until it, until it's done it will be at the front of the queue oh I didn't finish telling you about the other yarn the green the beautiful green which is really doing some weird crazy striping um, I didn't realize I mean, when you look at it on the skein, which I'll show you in a sec, it does not look like this. But yeah, I got some weird, some weird, it actually looks more pronounced on screen than it does on, in person. Yeah, some weird striping going on with this beautiful green yarn, which is from the company that is known as The Gray Sheep. It used to be Little Gray Sheep, but now it is The Gray Sheep. And this is Steinwolf, Fine Wolf, Stein fine wool. I always want to say stein wool fine wool, but it's stein fine wool four ply, which is also classified as a sport weight. This is the colorway squid ink pasta. I don't think she does repeats of her colors very often. I think she comes up with different color names all the time. But this is like a very beautiful dark, almost black hunter green. It's like very, very deep green. It's beautiful. Yeah. So Pink Velvet by Andrew Mowry. Gonna get done. It is going to be done in the next couple weeks, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's wonderful because I'm in this stockinette, mindless, easy to knit phase of it. I've got to get it finished because I have Rhinebeck knitting to do, um, which I'm going to show you next. <laughs> I'm working on my Rhinebeck sweater. And I have gift knitting coming up, so I've got a few gifts that I want to get done. I want to get knitted and done uh, for Christmas. I'd like to get them all done before Thanksgiving, which I think I will be able to. I think I should make it um, if I don't get distracted. And, you know, 
we get distracted. So let me tell you about my Rhinebeck sweater, which is my other, oh my God, I have made so much progress on this. So I, you know, Andrea Maury came out with her new Spark and Spice cardigan, cardigans. They're beautiful. They're worsted though. And uh, funny enough, like when those, when that pattern was released, there was a lot of grousing on Instagram, at least on social media about pricing and about, because the pattern, if you knit with the yarns, I think it would cost you somewhere around $400 for the yarn, depending on your size. Like you, I guess if you're a smaller size, it wouldn't cost that much, but maybe for me, it would be about 400 maybe a little less, 380 something like that, if you bought the yarn that she recommended. And I was looking at it and I was thinking to myself, I don't really wear worsted weight sweaters. Like they're just too heavy. Like once in a while, if I know I'm going to be outside for a, an extended period of time in the winter and I want to layer up, I'll put on a, wes a worsted waist sweater. But most of the time, like I'm inside and I'm going outside for brief periods of time. And you know, in, when we're inside in fall and winter, we keep the heat down like in the mid 60s so it's chilly enough to like have a sweater on but the sweaters that i reach for are fine gauge sweaters they're fingering weight uh, maybe a dk weight but something heavier than that is too heavy for me and so people were writing well, pricing thing aside people were writing um things like this is the worsted weight sweater you never you never knew you needed and i'm just like i don't need any worsted weight sweaters nothing against the pattern the pattern's beautiful I may end up doing to it what I did with the throwback, which was I knit the throwback, which was designed, I think, for worsted. I knit that in fingering weight. I may end up doing that with that eventually, but right now, I don't know what made me think this, <laughs> but I went back and looked at the shifty sweater, because that was the pattern of the year of Rhinebeck last year, also by Andrea Maori. Also, a pretty expensive sweater to put together if you use the yarn. It's knit entirely out of spin cycle yarn. And spin cycle yarn, it's knit, what I didn't realize about the shifty, so I was just looking at it just to see, like, oh, that was a crop sweater. You could do a cardigan style if you wanted because you could steak it. Um, and you could, you know, you could have a, you know, uh, you, you could knit it in lighter weight was it so I wanted to know was it designed for the dream state by spin cycle or was it designed for the dyed in the wool and it was designed for dyed in the wool and I was like huh you know I have a lot of single skeins of dyed in the wool I wonder if I have enough for this sweater so I'm looking at it and I'm like well I could kind of put together a palette that would work but I really should buy the base for it. And for some reason in my head, it was a four skein um, project, but it's not. It's a six skein project. <laughs> so it was a four, I thought it was a four skein project, and I was like, huh, so for like, I don't know, like $140 to $50, I could have the yarn. Like, I have the contrast colors. I would have the yarn for this pattern. And wow, well, you know what? I think this is going to be my, my Rhinebeck sweater. Let me go hunting for the yarn, like what color I want. And I remembered Starlight Knitting Society had the yarn. So if you watched my last episode, you're, the yarn that I chose is not going to be a surprise to you because I showed it last time. I had just gotten it. Now I'm going to show you some of the progress that I've made with it. Um, so I decided to do the shifty. I decided to uh, use... Um, Cassiopeia. There it is, caked. Okay, now you can see it. So you see how it's it's a beautiful like turquoise into blue into yellow with a little bit of green in there. The skeins caked up a little different each one. So these are all the same color. This is the colorway Cassiopeia, or Cassiopeia from spin cycle, but exclusive colorway to Starlight Knitting Society, which is in Portland, Oregon. Um, yeah, so 
I loved, I remembered it and I was like, I really, really want it. So I went and put four skeins in my cart and then I went back to check the pattern just to make sure that was the right amount that I needed. Because I also knew I wanted to make it longer because I, again, crop style, not really flattering, like something that's going to end the waist, not really flattering, I think, for my body type. I really needed, I think, I'm more comfortable wearing a sweater that's slightly longer than that, like kind of around 24, I can do 23, I think, even maybe 22 and a half, but I really need it to be, you know, from shoulder, the inches that I'm talking about are from shoulder down to the bottom. Somewhere in that 24 to 26 range is where I like to aim for with all my sweaters. Anyway, so I was like, okay, I might need another skein. Let me just go check the pattern real fast. So I go look at the pattern and I'm like, oh, for my size, I need six skeins. That's what she's saying. But I actually, I think... I am going to be, because I knit loose, I think I'm probably going to be knitting the smaller size. How many skeins is that? Oh, that's also six, but just six in a little bit. So, <coughs> or rather five in a tiny bit. So I think with six, I'm more, I have more than enough to do the length that I need. Fine. Put them all in my cart. $192. Because they're $32 each. <laughs> it's just like, okay, I really want to do this. So I went ahead and bought those. Um, I did have contrast colors here already that I had already purchased. I had, uh, so the yarn arrived and I um, put together these two colors which I've had in my stash for about two years. This is uh, Cataclysm and this is Ruination. Ruination I actually used a touch of it. I used about eight grams of it for the throwback that I did. Yes, throwback. I'm just making sure I'm getting her names right. The cardigan, yeah. So I had made that for my Rhinebeck sweater last year. For one of, one of a few Rhinebeck sweaters. Because I made three Rhinebeck sweaters last year. Yeah, so let me show you. I ended up, the third color, I waffled over. I had some um, of this orange, which is Stay Out of the Forest, in my stash. And I thought that might be a little bit harsh. So I waffled on it. I'm going to show you the sweater and then we'll talk about my waffle, my color waffling. So here is you know, the progress I have made on it so far. I have got uh, the color Cataclysm completely knit in. I am working on my second color. And I have separated for the sleeves. And so far, I love it. Let me see if I can show you. This color, this so I ended up using the color, this orangey pink is Midsummer. It's a color that they, I think they just made it this, um, I think they just made it this summer. At least it's the first time I've noticed it. Maybe it's been around. Uh, so yeah, I ended up using that. I really, really love it. It's like kind of like a sunset in a way. But yeah, so then the idea is that I'll knit, uh, the next section will be using this pinky yellowy color, and then I'll be using Ruination, this purpley color. I might need a fourth color. Um, I think I'm going to run out of yarn if I don't use a fourth color, the way that I'm reading the pattern. I mean, this, I ended up making the size two, which I'm making a size two to get to a 40 inch. So she recommends zero like negative two to positive two or negative one to positive one inch ease, but she really says you should hit your bust. So my bust measurement is like 39. So I went with 40 <laughs> inch because I was like, I don't think I want it to fit my bust exactly. I think I want a little positive ease in there. This fabric, you're, it, this is a mosaic knit, and there is so much ease built into the stitch that I think what will happen when I block it, because I, I was really amazed with my swatch, how much it blocked out. Like, see the difference like be, with, the, with the stitch and puckering? So it really opens up in, in blocking. Like, I really think what's going to happen is that you're going to end up seeing the color more like this. Actually, let me show you the back where I'm pulling it. I think you'll see the color more like that. So what I read in the project notes were for people with this, um, that were making this pattern was that a lot of people were unhappy with the, the distance they got from the neck down to here where it's separated for the sleeve. They were, 
They seem to be complaining that it just was baggy there. It didn't fit right. And I think a lot of that has to do with the mosaic knit. This like very, it knits, it's almost like you're creating these blisters and they just, they open up. So what I realized from blocking, from making a swatch and blocking it, that, um, that if I, cause I, my instinct always when I end up knit, so my row count hit hers. It matched her pattern, but my stitch count was too big. So I reduced the stitch count down. I talk all about this in another video, how to do this. So you don't have to follow along. I'll put on screen. I'll, I'll even put a link in if I remember in here to, so you can see how to do this yourself. So I took my stitch count. I reworked my stitch count, stitch per inch to figure out which pattern size I should make. So I figured for my looking for the size that I wanted, I should have made like a three to four, probably a three if I followed her advice on the negative to positive ease measurement. Um, so I ended up making a two and then normally I would make the, I would go down, if my row count was the same, I would make sure that I did the right number of repeats or rows to match the size that I should have made. So I, in my mind, I was knitting using the size, making the size two stitch count wise, but I was going to do the row count of size three. But in knitting this and, and seeing how scrunched up it was, I was like, well, my row count is the same. Let me just count how many inches, like how if you, you know, if once this is blocked, how big will size two be? And it turns out it's nine inches from shoulder to um, the sleeve split. And that's perfect for me. Like I know I need eight minimum. Nine gives me ease in that area. So seven and a half is probably my actual measurement. So an eight gives me, you know, a, a snug fitting armhole. Nine gives me, is a generous armhole. 10 is like if I want a baggy um, look, I would do 10 inches. So if I had knit the three row count wise, I would have ended up with 10 inches uh, for the drop, which I was like, it, for a sweater that's going to fit my bust measurement, I don't really think I want a baggy armhole. So I went ahead and just knit the two. Um, yeah. The only other mod I did besides like modifying for my own stitch count was, uh, and the length, the only other mod I did was I did not do the tubular cast on because long time viewers will know I'm not a fan. <laughs> I mean, tubular cast on is not so bad, but, uh, tubular bind off is whew, gnarly. Not my thing. I just decided I wasn't going to do either. It's, I don't, and I don't, I don't miss it. I mean, the spin cycle yarn has so much going on in it. I don't think it's needed. Yeah. So this was an investment of money and, um, but I have no regrets. It's so beautiful. This is what's left of midsummer. So you can kind of get a gander at what the colors are doing. So it had this like very intense sort of, um, soft blue in there. And there's a little bit more coming through here. It's much softer here than it was uh, in the skein. Um, so yeah, I really waffled on this color. So initially, when I got the uh, the Cassiopeia, I didn't want to use Stay Out of the Forest because it was too bright. So I went, I went and ordered um, from Brooklyn General Store. I ordered uh, this color, which is Rusted Rainbow. And I mean, it weighs in nice with these, but I was worried that it was going to be a little too jarring. I wanted that to kind of go together, but I don't know. I just, I, I really waffled. <laughs> I still don't know how this would look together because I haven't knit one stitch. Um, so when this came, I was like, wow, it's still a little dark. I'm not sure I want to go with that. I think I want something lighter and more more bright. So I, I ordered this from Spin Cycle. Um, and, you know, meantime, I was knitting away on the, uh, uh, using the green, this color, Cataclysm. Um, yeah, so this came and I went ahead and 
knit with it and I still wasn't sure, but now I'm sure. I like it. I think it's going to be fine. Like I, I think what I was thinking when I was looking at other people's patterns, it looked like they had a more smooth transition, though Andrea's sweater... I have actually seen it in the flesh. I ended up standing in, in on the on an escalator behind her at Vogue, and she was wearing hers. Really pretty. If it wasn't Vogue 20, it was Vogue 19. I ended up on the escalator. I didn't know it was her. And it was funny. Someone was coming up the escalator in the other direction, and they saw they were about to compliment her on her Shifty sweater and then saw that it was her. <laughs> but her anyway, her sweater does have kind of a break in the color. Like, her, the color that she used on top was uh, a pretty bright green, and then it went into these more autumnal colors. And then the green comes back again in the sleeve because she ends the sweater after the three color repeats. And then the sleeve is longer, though, than because it's cropped. So the sleeve ends up being longer and she ends up re-knitting, like knitting the, the green section again. So I was like, you know, I'm okay with it. I think this is the idea of it, right? I'm sorry if I'm like kind of going on and on about this. Um, you're probably like, gosh, can you just move on? Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, yeah, I think this is the idea of it. I mean, spin cycle is supposed to like this color change between them, the shades, the shading of the same exact color skein to skein is supposed to happen. And the, you know, change between from one color to the next is supposed to happen and you don't need to have a gradient necessarily which w I was thinking I'm like do I need a gradient should I be using a blue like should I be taking colors out of the <laughs> out of this color palette or do I contrast like I really don't know but I know I always like contrast better so I think I'm just gonna do contrast so that's what I did and I do think this purple blue color ruination is going to give me some pop but I also think it's going to have some low contrast moments where this sort of um this green here isn't that far off some of the colors that are in the um you know the yarn itself so the base yarn so anyway that is my Rhinebeck sweater <laughs> even though there's no Rhinebeck it'll all be virtual um I just really wanted to do a shifty and uh, yeah, probably next year I'll do a spark, <laughs> a spark or, or a spice cardigan, or maybe a combo like Rachel from Spin Cycle did, where she did the spark cardigan, but she did the pockets from the spice cardigan. Um, I will have put pictures on in case you're wondering what the heck I'm talking about, spark and spice and all of that. Um, but yeah, that is my Rhinebeck sweater. I am, this is my new obsession. Uh, I want to just get this done so I can work on this. <laughs> but I also want to get that green velvet done. So I will um, be working on that. I finished, I finished the third skein of Kim Dye's yarn. Uh, good time, good days. Sorry, good days, good days. 100% Targi wool in the colorway good days. This is the third I've caked them all because again this is I have talked about this being for a secret project I'm actually hoping there's enough left over for me to make a baby sweater I think there will be because it's a pretty significant yardage each of them are um, they are three ply I've three plied them I wanted to show you the color differences I think they're really it's very interesting so this was the first skein I, I spun and, and I didn't do any special color management. This is just how they came out. And this is the second one I spun. So I, I think this one has mostly green in it. I think this one has mostly blue. Or sorry, this was the third one I spun. And this was the second one, which came out the darkest because I think it has mostly purple in it. So I don't think you really see... See that this is the purple one, this is the blue one, and then here's the green one. Let me see if I can show you them all together. Yeah, so they go together, they're complementary. I I have to think about how I'm gonna use these in the sweater. The sweater that I'm making, the secret sweater that I can't tell you too much about, I'm think I'm pretty sure it's a bottom up knit. So yeah, I've gotta figure out how um, I'm going to combine these colors. Like, I'm definitely going to be alternating skeins. 
Um, but I want to plan that. I want to think about that. I think that this one might be the bridge color. Yeah, so this might be the color, the anchor color that kind of goes, helps me blend the uh, two skeins together. I may start with the purple if it's bottom up and then start alternating with this after the rib and then um, bring the lighter one in. I think that'll be nicer, if, especially if it's bottom up so that it's lighter on top um, and darker on the bottom. So yeah, that's one thing I got spun. I really didn't think I was going to have any other spinning to show you um, because I kind of took a break from spinning. I put my spinning wheel, uh, I didn't put it away, but I left it out though I didn't really have anything planned to knit um, with it, or to sorry to spin. I didn't really have anything that I really wanted to spin necessarily. Really wanted to just get this one done, and this one I kind of, you know, lollygagged on. But uh, one day last week, I was inspired to uh, start working on a, a bat. Like I started to think about the uh, three ply spin that I had done that I showed in my last episode that ended up, that was inspired from the spin cycle dream state where you end up with a gradient in the, in the skein. So I wanted to deliberately try to make a gradient in the skein using these bats that had high contrast colors. So it was a, it was a um, orange, pink, and green color. I, I don't love the color combo and I talked all about that last time, but I was really happy with the results, with the way of lining the colors up. I figured out that I needed to line the colors up like each bobbin had to be lined up vertically. So I decided to try one, a, another um, version of that. So this is what I got. This is a bat by Nicole Frost of Frost. I think her company name is Frost Yarn. Oh, I had the um, card, why? I'll show you the card in a minute. Um, so it's, I think it's Frost Yarn. So in, she's, she, if you follow her, she is a California based indie dyer who is very open about her struggles, her life struggles, and um, some of the, like her upbringing. She had a very traumatic upbringing and she's, she's open about it. I'm not like divulging any secrets or anything. Everything I know about her, I've read on her Instagram. Um, but she had last year had a baby right around this time, maybe a little earlier in the summer, but I think her baby's about a year. Um, and she, right after the birth, like the baby was under a month, she launched a fiber club. And it was, I've seen, I had watched her, watched her Instagram and seen her work and was intrigued enough to join the fiber club. And the way that she was running the club was she was um, offering up three months of a fiber club where you get a bat each month, but she was going to ship them all at once at the end of November. So I signed up. <laughs> and so I guess I got uh, August, oh, sorry, September, October, and November's clubs all at once. And I, But I bought it right around this time of year. So this was one of the club colors. This was a colorway called Malibu Palm. Bat. And I think when I got these bats last December, I opened them and showed, I was showing how beautiful they were. I was gushing about them. Like she really went all out with the colors. They're just really, really gorgeous bats to look at. I have one here because it, I'm going to be, um, oh, here, I have her card. I can show you. Yeah, it's Frost Yarn. There you go. Frost Yarn. She makes yarn too, of course, um, but she does fiber. She has a big drum carter, so she does these big bats. But this is um, one of the bats. So you can see that there's like this purple. Oh, my, my uh, camera changed color. This is accurate color-wise. So there's like this rust, high contrast rust with this um, teal blue. And I think she called this color something teal and something teal and terracotta cliffs. Teal and terracotta cliffs. So this one was, it's similar in colors, only it has more purple and pink and um, there's some gold in there. There was more, there's more variation in this skein in the rust and more variation in the blue in this one. <coughs> mm. Having allergies. 
So my eyes were kind of red, a little red from allergies. Like I'm, I think I'm allergic to ragweed, which is uh, pollinating right now in our area. Yeah, so this is gonna, I think this will be my next bin and I'm gonna do another three ply. But before I do that, I think we need to see this caked. So I am going to run and go cake this and come back and show you what this looks like. Oh my God, look at that. Let me show you this side actually. I think you can see the, the gradient a little better. Stop focusing on Martha. Isn't it so pretty though? So this, so what I did with this, I had the three rows of fiber. I'll put a picture in here. And I, so the bat was laid out in this like rust to blue or blue to rust, like this deep blue um, to rust way. So I just tore the bat in by, I chunked it by color. So there was like this rusty color um, and then this yellow color and then a turquoise color and then pale pink or purpley pink, then a deeper pink, purple, and then blue, bright blue. And so I, I just ripped it and then I took each piece um, and ripped it in thirds and then weighed them so that they were more or less equal all the way through. But in spinning this, I messed up somehow with one of the bobbins. So one of the bobbins ended up like, so I first started spinning. Yeah, I spun, I started to spin from this end. So this was the beginning of each bobbin and then this was the end the very end. Um, so in spinning this, I, the blue section, so I started with blue, the blue section matched when I did the three plies together, it matched pretty well, but somewhere in that blue to rust, it got off. Like I had too little weight in some section. I ended up actually, when I was all done doing the three bobbins, I found a, a chunk of some blue. Um, that must have been belonged to the third bobbin that ended up short. Sorry, some drama over by the bird and cat. <laughs> some bird cat drama happening over there. Um, the uh, so anyway, it ended up off a little bit, which I actually think worked to my advantage. Be until I got to the very end, and uh, I ended up running out on the third bobbin. Um, way before I, I ran out on the other three. But I kind of like the way I think it is part of the success of the gradient feel to these colors because one bobbin was slightly off. So I didn't have a perfect match all the way through. And I, I really, really liked that, that sort of blending. So there's a, there's a pretty significant section where there's like blue blending in with the two shades of rust. And it just ended up making like... Um, just reminded me of this like like looking for treasure like you find like especially you could see it right in there I think you can see like the rust with bits of yellow and and turquoise blue and purple just like popping through I think it's gonna be so pretty you can see it there too right there I think it's just gonna be amazing I did end up like when I got down to the bottom I had a little bit of white on a bobbin left over from the last time I tried this experiment of doing a gradient, um, you know, color range. So I had a little bit of white left on one bobbin, so I pulled that bobbin out and used that as the third um, bobbin for to finish off the other two colors. And that's what you're. That's why you're seeing a much lighter rust on the outside, on the outer, um, you know, probably like six or eight yards here. So yeah. But this will be really pretty. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Uh, who knows? Who knows? I'm thinking about selling my hand spun. I'm thinking about, I have a website. I, uh, it's defunct, like, but I could resurrect it. Um, I've been thinking I should migrate some patterns over there in case people aren't on Ravelry and want to buy the patterns. It would be a way, another way to distribute them. And I've been thinking about like selling some hand spun that I don't have any plans for that I'm just making for the fun of it and you know that I'm not 
necessarily attached to but yeah more on that later if you're interested do let me know in the comments below or if you think that would be something that other people might be interested in um, I do see people selling some hand spun um, I think it could get quite pricey because like this bat these um, frost Nicole Frost bats that I bought this club it was they were forty dollars each which is a lot for bats I did it because it was kind kind of charity because she really needed to make some money she'd been out of work for a while with the baby um, but yeah so I it was a lot these were these were very very expensive bats most bats are not that expensive and like the braids and things you know average around you know fifteen to twenty dollars. For four ounces which is pretty good um but yeah the bats some bats like some of them some this fiber can be pretty expensive so you're already starting like this would already this is already a 40 dollars skein of yarn uh, which is crazy and then i i've hand spun it so it's added even more um value to it so i don't believe i would be able to sell this um for a price that anybody would pay except maybe like a relative of mine but um, yeah, so I, I do have some other skeins. I, I just have to come up with pricing and see if I uh, put them out there and try it. So I may do that. I don't. I'm not in a hurry to do that. It might be something I do this fall. Just I'll have to see how my semester goes. As so we start school in two weeks. Yikes. Anyway, moving on. Okay, stash and future knits. Because I have a couple ideas for future knits. I bought some more fiber. I have a lot of like single skeins. I really, really was attracted. It's funny. These are similar colors. I'm not purposeful. This is by Melianated Boho Babe. This her name on. It's Amanda Solomon. Her name is her Instagram handle and her store handle is. I'm pretty sure it's Melanated. I'll have put it all on screen. Boho Babe. Um. Yeah. 100% superwash merino in a one-of-a-kind colorway. I just was really loving the color combo of this lime green and purple and rust. Um, I guess I'm on a rust kick. I also ordered um, some yarn, some fiber from, more fiber from Kim Dye's Yarn. This is some beautiful, she put this on Instagram and I just got weak in the knees. So I bought it. This is 80-20 uh, Pullworth Silk in the colorway Prairie. I really love it. I don't know why she called it Prairie. It reminds me of the of a show that had a character named Prairie. But this is so pretty. And I like that these cashmere lace weights that I got from Italy, my trip from Italy last year, match it. They're going to somehow go together. I'm not sure what. That um, lace weight actually is the same content as this. So, and it's also, uh, this. it's the exact same yarn practically. It's like slightly different. Like I think it might be slightly more cashmere, maybe like 80% instead of 79. I don't know, something like that. But it's basically the same yarn. So yeah, so I thought, I, I just loved these colors and I also realized that it would match that dusty rose um, lace weight yarn that I can maybe, I don't know, somehow put together. So that's something that I'm just gonna let cook for a while. I also got a fiber box, my fourth fiber box from Stitch Together Studio. I bought a subscription of eight boxes for the year from Stitch Together Studio fiber boxes. Um, that was how I got the orange, green, pink bat that I had made to last episode uh, into the Dream State Experiment yarn. Um, but this is the one, so the summer solstice one. It's a beautiful uh, sparkly pink and yellow um, bat, three ounce bat came with that. Uh, so this box also came with this beautiful wool soap. And the scent called Thumbprint, Summer Solstice scent, actually. Is the company Thumbprint? Yeah, the company is Thumbprint. So that came in the kit. Uh, a little tiny skein came, like a mini skein came with that, which I have already caked because I have it planned for another project, uh, which I'll show you next. And I got this candle called Sprung. It smells really good. It smells like summer. 
And I got a bunch of stitch markers and the mini skein and these beautiful uh, quartz pieces. Um, I ended up, this this box was so late. Like I, I think she shipped one to me and I never got it. Um, that was like in June because she, she posted that her August, um, her August boxes were going out. And, and so I emailed her and I said, you know, I never got the June box and I forwarded her my original order and she, she emailed me back and said, I'm sending you the June box now, um, or the, the Litha box now. And so the, the other box should be here soon. Like it's an August box. So, um, yeah, I assume it'll be here. Who knows though? The post office is such a mess right now. I feel sorry for our postal service. Uh, I also shopped the Hohe Seconds sale. So she had a warehouse seconds sale, meaning like her bags had some problem with them that she didn't think were good enough to sell um, at full price. So they were de steeply discounted, I think up to 30% depending on the object. So this is her, the first bag I believe she made, or it has a lot of versatility. Um, I think it's normally like $80 and it was, I got it for 50 or 60 something like that but it's the navy blue uh suede and at first when she launched pre-pandemic when she launched uh the blue bags they were only available at local yarn shops and then she started to um sell them herself or maybe because it's a second um this has an interesting i have not used it at all yet but you're supposed to be able to reattach this there so that you have a handle, a handy handle, or you can just uh, carry it as a zipper pouch. Um, I think the flaw on this is that stripe right there. I assume that's the flaw. I don't mind it though. It's suede. It's leather. It's natural. Those are natural occurring. I'm not going to try to fix that. Okay. That's all I have aside from this last feature cast on, which I'm not in a hurry for this. So you may not see this again for a while. Um, I'm going to make a rainbow, a rainbow blanket out of minis and my rainbow, my pride rainbow set that I got um, for my granddaughter. Um, it'll probably be something like I get, I'll give her around her birthday. This is the mini that I got with the summer solstice from Stitch Together. So I put that into knit with the yellow, give, give that yellow some, some interest. So my plan is to knit um, in Roy G. Biv color <laughs> scheme with two strands together, which is why there's so much. So a solid with a speckle. Um, so knit all the red, then knit the orange, then knit the yellow, the green, the blue, the purple. Um, and you know, some color changes in there. I have some hot pink planned and some, most of this is either, uh, minis that I had or just leftover yarns. Um, I've got some turquoise in there to do the blue green transition. I think it's going to be really pretty. I'm so excited. It's a lot of yarn. <laughs> All yarn I had on hand though. So that's awesome. Yeah. And other than that, I have some other gift knits, um, in mind. I have a friend who is a coworker who is, uh, pregnant as well. And she's also having a girl. So I have another baby blanket in mind for her. Um, and I'm making some gifts for my family for Christmas that I want to get going on. So, yeah. So all of that in the works and, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I hope you enjoyed today. Thank you so much for spending time with me as always. I really appreciate it. I appreciate hearing from you. If you have comments that you'd like to, you know, talk to me about, or if you have questions, please just go ahead and comment and I will comment back to you. And, um, yeah, I look forward to reading all of that. And I look forward to sharing more with you in a couple of weeks. I hope you have a great, wonderful, safe and healthy, next couple weeks and I will see you again soon. Bye!